Hello and welcome. You're watching a special report on UID, and today we have here with us Matthew Thomas. He is a former he is a former Defence Services uh, officer and a missile scientist turned civic activist. Matthew, your first impressions. You've seen that there is a massive chaos in the data collection process, which is really the first step in the life cycle of the UID project. Give us your first impressions. I mean, any talk about data integrity becomes a moot point when you see that these enrollment agencies are practically generating a business of their own. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, <coughs> interview. I'm honored, I'm grateful, and I feel that my work would not go waste. Uh, I'm neither shocked nor surprised by it. In fact, I'd anticipated this chaos. I'm mildly amused, and it has confirmed my worst fears. Uh, the whole method of empaneling these so-called enrollment agencies has been absolutely irresponsible. Uh, anybody and everybody who wanted to become an enrolling agency was allowed with some minimum financial um, capability. There are tea estates, there are stockbrokers, there are printing presses, there are microfinance companies. Uh, there are education societies. All kinds of people with neither experience nor wherewithal are in it. Secondly, there is no contract with them, there is no privity between the UIDI or the government or these people. So it's a free for all. And the result is... You mean there is no memorandum of understanding with these uh, organizations? No, no, no. no the, the, not at all. See, the, in oh. fact, this is, there is no privity between the players. The UIDA empanels enrolling agencies. The UIDA has got an MOU with state governments. The MOU itself, in my view, is not proper. It's illegal because the UIDA has no business to sign MOUs, and MOUs are not contracts. And there is no legal contract binding the two organizations? No. The system is that the, um, the state government then, after the MOU, appoints or designates registrars. We have not even seen contracts between registrars and the state governments. They merely say you follow the guidelines, guidelines of UIDI, and they choose enrolling agencies. The registrars have some kind of a contract with the enrolling agency and to carry out the enrollment as per the UIDI guidelines. But what I'm trying to say is the enrolling agencies are so irresponsible, ill-trained, and ill-equipped, they just do whatever they feel like. For example, these are photographs taken by me of the documents which you submit, which are, which are lying on the floor of a post office, okay, including the equipment. You'll see in the background the equipment. This is a post office in Bangalore where the enrolling agencies abandoned the enrolling center for about a week. Secondly, the people who work in these enrolling agencies, who are they? There's no check. Nobody knows who are they or what they are doing. So the chaos is inevitable, and the whole system of having introducers, no verification of the address or the identity of the person, it's just a free for all. It's bound to happen. It's a, uh, as the the cliche goes, it's a <laughs> it's something wait, uh, a shamosal waiting to happen. So what got you interested in this? Uh, you're called the RTI man. You filed RTIs over RTIs um, uh, on the matter. What made you get into this RTI marathon? The, I, the RTI is a much later, um, later what you call introduction. I, the first impression in January 2009, when the Prime Minister announced the appointment uh, of uh, Mr. Nilankani as the chairperson of an authority and for doing this kind of work, my f immediate impression was, my God, how can this ha be done? I am a technologist, I have used IT, for manufacture of missiles, where there are hundreds of components which go through a large number of critical fabrication operations. So I said, this is practically impossible when you look at the size and the geography of the country. It's not possible. Why are they trying this? So I wrote to the Prime Minister. Uh, I wrote to Mr. Nilankani. I asked them, why are you doing this? I didn't receive any reply. Then I started looking at the details. I looked at what the newspaper reports, magazines were saying. And uh, I, a friend of mine had asked the UIDA in an RTI application as to who are the foreign companies involved in this, the country of origin. And the reply was, there is no way of finding out the country of origin of the 
uh, the contractors. I mean, that shocked me. How can somebody ostensibly representing or purporting to be an authority of the government of India signing off contracts without knowing the country of origin of the company? Then what do they know of the company? That is where I started off. So I asked them, who are these contractors? Give me copies of the contractors. Then I found an attempt to hide that. They refused to give me that information, quoting Section 81D of the RTI Act. And 81D says, any information which will compromise the competitiveness of the, uh, of the company cannot be disclosed. And there is also a proviso to Section 8, which says that any information which is to be disclosed to Parliament should be disclosed to citizens. So I pointed this out and went in appeal. The appellate authority of UIDA repeated the reply of the PIO. So I went to the CIC. The, and the CIC, after almost two years, ruled in my favor that they should give me contracts. When I, they gave me the co copies of the contracts, I found annexures missing. When I asked for them for the annexures, they said that, no, they can't provide it because of the confidentiality co uh, clause. So I found there is an attempt to hide the names, the purpose of these foreign contractors. It sounded fishy to me. And that's where in this process I started filing a large number of RTIs. So whatever I say is based on documentary evidence gathered through RTI from government sources as well as downloaded from internet. And I've confronted the government, the planning commission, its departments, UIDI, etc. with this evidence. They have chosen to remain silent. They have not controverted a single allegation which I've made. Why do you think there is this air of secrecy and uh, and a certain sense of hurriedness to this project? Well, actually, uh, going back to your background as a defense services officer, give us a perspective on the uh, international security implications of this project. There is this lot of talk about security of data, uh, profiling of individuals. Where does this fear come from? Uh, you must have uh, come across two things. One is WikiLeaks. And the other is the Snowden revelations. The USA, especially after 9-11, has been snooping on various, various countries. And India is one of the prime targets of the snooping activity. Uh, now, they don't have to snoop. We are giving them the data because I found that the companies involved are companies from the United States who are prime defense and intelligence contractors of USA. So there's a very serious breach of security. You know, to that, the office of UDI might argue that information would be offered to them anyway. I mean, there are certain authorities who would seek information whenever there is a sensitive issue that comes up. So what, why this fear of uh, individuals' privacy being, um, being attacked? Yeah, I wish... Uh, I could say that the UIDI is as innocent as my daughter because she asked me when I told her I'm doing this work, what can they do with my data? So I told her, little girl, you do not know how useful data is. And I didn't tell her that, I left it at that. But let me tell you, there is in WikiLeaks a, a cable of Hillary Clinton addressed to all the embassies, which asked them to gather biometric and demographic data of all important people in various countries. Secondly, this demographic and biometric data is useful to uh, countries in two ways. One, it has got enormous commercial uh, value. You know the demographic, you know the income, and it is, uh, when, it is, when it is linked to various uh, other databases like banks and so on. You know the buying pattern when it is linked to credit cards. So it has got enormous commercial value. Secondly, it has got a lot of intelligence value. You know how the demographic is spread out in terms of age, in terms by, uh, by looking at the names, you can guess the religion, you can guess the communities, you can know castes in many places, you can know where they are located. And if you link, so there's a huge amount of demographic and uh, biometric data which is going abroad, handed over to them on a platter. Otherwise, for them to garner this information would take an enormous amount of time and effort and money. Here we're just giving it. 
Yes, and going back to the previous statement that you made about the government trying to hide a few things, they're, they're not revealing information, even RTIs have not been that successful. Why do you think a system which has been fiercely discredited in the US and the UK is openly being embraced, uh, embraced by the Indian government? Why, why the hurry? Yeah, hurry is for a different reason, but before the hurry, let me say why is it something which is discredited abroad? For example, there was the Australia card. It was the national ID card of Australia. It started in 1986 and after 20 years of trial, linking it to income tax and so on, they gave it up. So they found it is not useful for identifying tax defaulters. Why is it being done here? I've, and it's being projected as a pro-poor initiative. So this is what caused me to probe a little further, one of the main causes. I find there is a huge amount of deception and deceit in, involved in it. Now, when I, and, and that is the reason why they try to hide this information and why they are propagating it. And UIDA is on record saying that this is similar to the SSN of USA. It is not. The social security number is meant to provide dole to people who are unemployed, who after various attempts have not been able to obtain employment. UIDI is merely identifying people, or so-called identification, even that they do not do. So the deception is to project it as something which is pro-poor, but gathering a lot of other information, linking it up to databases, and handing it and giving the control over to various foreign companies, which have got very close links with US intelligence agencies. So this deceit is what I am really upset about. The country is handing over data. In fact, when this data is linked to bank accounts, when it is linked to welfare schemes, you can disrupt any of these things. Supposing the database administrator just switches it off for a couple of hours. It's like your banking system <laughs> off for a few hours. So it's a very dangerous thing. Nobody will hand over data. There are so many cyber attacks which go on. Now no cyber attack is required because all the data and every transaction is going to be recorded there. Sure. It's interesting you talk about uh, financial inclusion being the main parameter. and uh, Projected parameter. Projected parameter. Um, considering we have cases in Hyderabad, for instance, where the number of applications for the UID uh, card exceed the population of the city and the number of cards issued exceed even that. Uh, where so either that means ghost IDs are being provided or a single individual has been provided multiple IDs how exactly does this help in financial inclusion if anything the actual beneficiaries seem to be left out of uh, of the equation uh, first, and, and amounting to financial exclusion if anything else firstly Satya it has nothing to do with financial inclusion that's just a marketing gimmick I believe that financial inclusion will come from the generation of employment. If people are given gainful, dignified employment and income comes into their banks or their homes, then you will have financial inclusion. By merely taking a person's biometrics or his name and they don't, many of them don't even have address. They sleep on the payments or in some night shelter. And then you give them a no frills account. Is that financial inclusion? Now, what I find is a part of the deception is this is actually uh, cashing in on ignorance of people. See, most people, even in high levels of bureaucracy or politics or judiciary or wherever it is, are not aware that this biometrics or databases are in any way useful or not useful. They imagine some or other that this will reduce leakages in, in the public distribution system or in uh, the gas supplies and so on. It will not. Let me just read for a second. Uh, an article which came in The Economist. The Economist is a very reputed magazine and way back, I think this is in 2010, this article appeared and the first paragraph, let me just read that paragraph, thanks to gangster movies, cop shows and spy thrillers, people have come to think of fingerprints and other biometric means of identifying evildoers as being completely foolproof. In reality, they are not and never have been and a few engineers who design such screening tools have ever claimed them to be so yet the myth has persisted among public at large and officialdom in particular in the process 
it has led especially since the terror attacks of September 11 2001 to a great deal of public money being squandered and worse to fostering a sense of security that is largely misplaced so this cashing in on ignorance squandering money with a hidden agenda is what i am opposed to so clearly this is perhaps not the uh, most efficient use to which uh, uh, data collection has been put to but then given the fact that the volume of data collected is so high there is an alternative school of thought that says uh, we have so much collected so much data is it just going to go waste is there any way it can be put to better use is there any could this be treated as an exercise in um, uh, any kind of a biometric system and its um, efficiency can the Aadhaar project be salvaged when IT started there used to be a cliche again GIGO it meant garbage in, garbage out. So to my mind, all this data, unverified data is just garbage. And what do you do with garbage? You burn it to generate electricity. And I'm not joking. In fact, my plea is that this should be immediately stopped. It should be destroyed. And I'll give you an example. In the UK, when they scra scrapped the scheme, they had by then collected only the data of 15,000 people. The UK government destroyed that data. They had an independent private auditor, public, uh, I mean, an auditor outside the government, auditing to ensure that the data is completely destroyed because you do not know where the data is. And then they spent 1.25 million pounds destroying the data of 15,000 people. Imagine what it would cost to just destroy the data. And if data is lying like this, how do you collect it and destroy it? You just can't. So it has to be destroyed immediately, no doubt. You can't use it. So the data has to be destroyed, says Matthew Thomas. Pretty strong arguments over there. With that, it's a wrap on this edition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Matthew Thomas, for joining us. Thank you for watching the show. We will continue to bring you more updates on the UID project as we track the developments of the project. Thank you and watch this space.